Hello folks, I hope you're having a great day today. Welcome back to this series, if you're coming back to one of my previous videos. Um, and also, if this is your first video of mine that you're watching, hey, I hope you're having a great day. Welcome to this series. Um, in this series, I look at some awesome, oftentimes forgotten or classic works in science fiction, fantasy, and horror to kind of see where they stand today or where they're at and do some reviews um, with the goal of bringing to, to light a lot of sort of these forgotten treasures. And that's why today I'm going to be really, really happy to bring to you a writer you've already heard of, a writer you've probably already read, but didn't realize this guy was a science fiction writer, um, and he was a big science fiction writer too, hugely influential. And that's actually Jack London's The Iron Heel. Um, he actually wrote more than this. This is kind of his first science fiction story. Um, we're going to be reading, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at some of the other stuff later. Uh, but The Iron Heel is actually my favorite of his of anything of his that he wrote, um, novels, short stories, and so forth. Now, you've probably heard of Jack London or read Jack London. It's kind of a part of growing up in America. He's this, you know, great, great American writer that we all all love. And I read Jack London stuff growing up, like Call of the Wild, White Fang, Sea Wolf. I read this short story. It was required reading in my English class in junior high, where it's set on the frontier, and there's this guy who's trying to light a fire to stay warm. Ultimately, he fails and he dies, but his dog survives and goes back to the to the local camp. Um, Jack London is a classic American writer. Um, he was hugely popular. Um, he definitely cha championed the underdog. He really sort of um, wanted to, to bring to light a lot of these underdogs, um, people that were sort of the traditional, a classic sort of um, undercard people that were coming against uh, and trying against a larger um, and, and people in, in his stories. Uh, he definitely wants to relate to these people. He also is one of the first people um, in American fiction <clears throat> to really sort of uh, champion um, and, and lionize uh, the sort of Native Americans that are out there too. And a lot of his stories will normalize Native Americans, um, which is good for people that are reading a lot of his stuff. Now, he's a person of his time. He uh, wrote, for example, an essay called uh, The Yellow Peril, uh, wherein he talks about some of the negative stuff that's happening from Asian immigration near where he was living on the West Coast, uh, which was big at the time. Um, so he's not perfect. He's not this person who was always, everybody come on in and hang out in my house, and everybody's equal, and so forth. But he was definitely ahead of his time um, when it came to things like that, uh, as he was one of the first champion like, like Native Americans and, and normalizing them in his literature and such. And he's heavily read today. But again, most people probably never realized this guy's actually a science fiction writer, too. Um, he was, and one of the things that makes him tick is that he was a socialist. And he uses his, uh, the, the, the money that he's making and his, the name that he's making for himself with all the writing that he's doing and all the successes that he's having. And he uses that to sort of infuse um, his socialist writings and so forth and to give it popularity and to give it reach. Now he will, in some places like Sea Wolf, um, he will have some socialist stuff that's kind of behind the scenes, um, some kind of socialist teachings that are kind of in there um, and such. But his real start for socialist sort of conversations is in the Iron Heel, where the socialism is probably like every paragraph sort of talks about his kind of socialist concepts and socialist teachings and so forth. Um, and unfortunately, we have removed um, Jack London's socialist aspects, I think, from a lot of his things. I was never told when, when learning about Jack London um, in my English class or reading about his stuff, uh, I was never told that he was a socialist and he was an absolute died in the wool socialist that he would that was his bread and butter um, and that was his, his reason for writing um, and he wrote stuff in order to be able to write about socialist causes and that the iron heel thus is the perfect example of that um, and so I was I was never told that um, and we have a tendency unfortunately in American history to sometimes remove uh, who people were um, from their story and and uh, and I think the best example of that is actually Helen Keller Helen Keller grew up um, and she was uh, praised as this almost American saint, as this perfect, perfect, you know, paragon of American virtue, of American uh, willpower, of the American desire to succeed no matter what. And she was, her stories on the front page of every single newspaper for years as they covered her story and how great she was, you know, for overcoming multiple disabilities. 
Um, however, after she overcame her disabilities and she began to connect with the world around her, she realized the world wasn't equal. That the world didn't, that not everybody was, you know, had, was able to afford, you know, these mentors and so forth. That she was, that they weren't all in a great place um, and so forth. That there were these issues, massive inequities. Um, remember, she's living in the era of the robber barons and stuff. So there are these massive inequities and such. So she very quickly adapted socialism as her cause, and she became the, one of the greatest speakers and of the socialist cause for for her throughout her entire life now if you're a newspaper somebody who said man she was great she was amazing how do you then what, what's your next story look like if you don't somebody who agrees with the socialist cause um, what, what does that look like um, and and the what they would say is oh well she was just her handlers are giving her wrong information. She's just being misfed information. Of course, she wasn't actually being misfed information, uh, but, they would, but they wanted to distance themselves from her. Um, but again, it's hard to do so. So she has been, you know, there's been books about her, you know, m uh, movies about her and so forth. And she's a hero to a lot of people in, as this, you know, great American hero. But without knowing she was a socialist too and they don't tell the full Helen Keller story you know it's 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 just impossible to tell who Helen Keller was as you know when she overcame her two disabilities um, from who she was as a socialist as soon as she overcame those two disabilities <laughs> it's just you can't do it and the same thing's true of Jack London you can't disassociate his socialist teachings um, and leanings and, pract and, 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 and preachings and from, his, uh, from his writings and who he was as a person. You can't do it. They're intertwined. They're interconnected together. And just like, just like Helen Keller's are interwoven, so are Jack London's too. And it's unfortunate, I think, that we don't tell that part of Jack London's side or talk about his science fiction works um, much. Um, in fact, I had to encounter the Iron Heel just by doing research on it. I had never heard of it beforehand. But the Iron Heel is important because it's the first dystopian sort of story. So let's take a look at the Iron Heel um, and, and what it does. So in the Iron Heel, it's set in the, the near future. And in the Iron Heel, um, in that storyline, um, and the Iron Heel itself has this amazing framework as a story that really, I think it just really grounds the story and makes it work really, really well. And it's, it's actually being written hundreds and hundreds of years later. Um, in this future society called the Brotherhood of Man, uh, which is a socialist society where everybody is, is loved, everybody is cherished, everybody gets what they need to to survive, and so forth. Um, and to, and, and, and uh, capitalism is gone. And, and London, like most socialists of his day, believes that capitalism is wrong, it's evil, and it won't stand the test of time, and, and will be shown to, for that. So he... Um, this story um, is set like hundreds of years ago in the future in the Brotherhood of Man, and it's looking back at events that have yet to happen. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a future looking back, um, and these people who are looking back are looking at a, at a, at a, at a text that's being written, um, and that, the text that's being written is the Iron Heel, and the Iron Heel is being written by the protagonist. It's a woman um, who is going to ultimately marry um, one of the great figures of her day, and, and this is her, her book that she wrote on it. Um, and then during the time that she's writing this and you're reading it um, in the book, you're also reading these sort of footnotes and an editor additions to it and so forth. So you can kind of see what the future people are, are saying about it. It's incredibly well done. Um, it works so well on multiple layers. And so it's, for example, it's a very, very strong read. Um, anyway, um, so that's kind of the framing device for the book. Now, the book is set in, in the near future when, when the socialist party has gotten to the point where it is a viable political alternative socialist candidates are being elected to office uh, and it looks like socialist um, policies are coming into play without sort of sacrificing sort of their morals on um, their sort of anti-capitalist causes um, and so as a result of this um, some capitalists are going to push back in sort of a counter-revolution as the socialists are getting more and more power democratically. Um, so they're going to push back and remove a lot of the democratic institutions of America. Um, they're going to create this sort of oligarchy. And he calls it the oligarchy. Um, and the oligarchy behind the scenes folks, are like, like the robber barons and such, are going to push back against it. And they're going to cr create this sort of dystopian state called the Iron Heel. And the Iron Heel is basically going to turn uh, workers into serfs. It's going to have mercenaries as its cause and folks that are sort of fighting um, to keep the status quo uh, and to keep their, their masters in check and so forth. So um, it's, it's very much kind of this antagonistic kind of old, old school hat where the companies and the people who run the companies are going to be sort of these, these, these major, major, major uh, uh, problems and, and hurting man and such. 
and, and so he calls it this sort of oligarchic pushback um, against the the natural uh, socialist, you know, d democratic uh, revolution that would happen. Um, so it's a pushback against that. Now it, that never happens in America on a large scale. Although it does happen in other nations on a large scale. For example, uh, the socialist president Allende was assassinated by the CIA um, and a more pro-American, uh, pro-capitalist uh, uh, counter-revolution uh, strikes, um, and that country is taken over. Um, so it does happen in other places. It just doesn't happen in America on the large level. It also, But it does happen in America, and it was happening in America at that time. Um, and so I think it's important to say that Jack London isn't coming just out of nowhere. So if you say, oh, Jack London, what are you doing? Why are you, where's this coming from? Why, why do you think that, uh, the perfect democratic sort of, uh, voting for things and such would, would be pushed back against, um, and removing sort of that sort of de democratic bedrock from the nation? It actually ha was happening at the time. Um, take an example, West Virginia, which is my home state. It's just one state. During the mine wars of West Virginia, um, at where um, uh, things had been illegal for decades and decades since the 1800s, like company script. You could not pay miners company script. You couldn't have a company store set up or anything like that. It was illegal in the state at the time. But it was that it was happening. Um, but you know the company was buying people out. It was it was uh, bribing judges and, and lawmen and so forth. And if you were somebody who was not uh, bribable and stood up against the system, like Sheriff Sid Hatfield did in Southern West Virginia, he was assassinated on the courthouse steps at almost noon as a message to all the lawmen, and judges, and so forth, saying you'd better get on our side, the, the side of the, the the coal mine owners and such. They hired. Um, gun thugs from the Baldwin Feltz detective agency to come in and sort of enforce their law, which is very much like the mercenaries of Jack London's um, Iron Heel. Um, they turned miners into virtual serfs where they had to come in. They couldn't leave. They couldn't, they were not making enough money. Um, the money was just in company script. You know, they had to pay for their own rent, pay for their room, pay for their stuff from the company store. And then by the time they had done that, they were more and more and more in debt. And there was an entire sort of, and if you tried to, 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 to rebel against that, then they would bring in gun thugs to stop it. If you were just striking. Then they would bring gun thugs to stomp you. They've had, a, uh, they, you know, the, they were behind the Matewan massacre, where they where they killed more than ten people in Matewan, West Virginia. One famous example was at night um, and during a strike, um, there was a miners' camp, and you had to have miners' camps because you couldn't be striking and remaining in your place because you are living on company property. So you had to leave company property in order to strike. So they were these little miner camps that were set up with your with all your stuff, your family, your kids, and so forth were in these tents. And one night there was this armored train called the Bull Moose Special, and it was armored. It had these machine guns, and it rode down the track at night past this, this this striking camp and fired its machine guns at all the tenants trying to kill the people that were there in order to silence it. That's a perfect example of what London would see as this sort of oligarchic pushback. Um, another example famously happened uh, when striking um, miners were bombed from airplanes and such. Um, and so there, there are multiple examples. In fact, the largest civil uprising in American history happened at Blair Mountain in Boone County, West Virginia. Last, ladies and gentlemen, that was the county I used to live in. Um, so, um, and that's just the story from a single state during 10 year period of the mine wars in West Virginia. That was happening in lots of other places too. So if you think that there isn't going to be this pushback against people that are, and, and there isn't this sort of um, interplay against things that were illegal at the time, <laughs> but they were still doing it anyway. Um, the, uh, the companies were still doing it anyway. They had a virtual serfs with mercenaries as their sort of, um, uh, you know, they're sort of uh, labor issues that they were having. Um, and and they, they would not let anybody tell them, you know, hey, look, you got to give us a fair wage. You got to stop paying us, you know, in this company script. You got to pay us what, we are, what we're making in actual cash and such. They wouldn't have it. Um, <coughs> and so as a result, one of the things that you see is, is this stuff happening in America at the time that Lennon's writing his, his story. So it's not as out, outlandish as you may think to think that socialist voters would start to push ahead because of all these things that are happening by companies, robber barons and such, and then to have a pushback that we were seeing on, in smaller levels already. So it's not that sort of bizarre to think about. And um, the, the basic story itself definitely is infused with that. So the story itself, once that happens um, and the Iron Heel takes over, 
Um, the main character um, is, is, is um, married to the, uh, the man who's going to become the major voice of the resistance. Um, it's going to lead to, so the book traces kind of the, the first, uh, that first start of the Iron Heel, uh, the first underground resistance, all the way up to the first uprising. First uprising is going to fail, um, and then the, this, this, this story is going to be sent out as a sort of a, a voice of the resistance to kind of and with the hope of that a second uprising will be soon to happen and that's kind of where the book leads off the framing device tells us that ultimately um, it did happen and that the iron heel was thrown off but it wasn't for more than 100 years later um, it took a long time, um, but ultimately, uh, the, what the revolutionaries in that early era wanted to have happen, and what they envisioned um, as being better for human, was actually something that was, in fact, better for humans. Um, so there is that sort of concept that happens in the story, and you're going to find all up all that pretty early on um, as, in, as part of that sort of narrative framing device that London has. Um, if you've never read a Jack London story, and I think probably anybody here who's American probably has at least heard of him, um, you'll know he's a quick read. Um, he's not somebody who's going to keep you up all night long. Even though the narrative framing device ha seems like it's coming from sort of an academic uh, um, angle, it's not, doesn't read like that. It's very quick to read, um, just like any Jack London story. There's a reason why kids uh, read Jack London. If you're from a place where Jack London isn't somebody that you normally read, well, he's a fast read. Um, if Jack London again is is somebody who who is somebody who definitely definitely would want you to remember that he's a socialist and would want you to have read The Iron Heel. And I recommend it a whole lot. It's a, as a soft science fiction story. Um, it's very very compelling. For example, George Orwell himself said of the story um, and of Jack London that he was one of the best. Uh, uh, people at predicting the future um, and really kind of understood where people were coming from and did a great job of it. It was hugely influential. For example, Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land reads like a little bit like uh, Jack London's The Iron Heel. Um, you can't read a modern dystopian story like 1984 uh, or Brave New World by Huxley or anything like that without uh, seeing the Iron Heel in those. It was hugely influential in all those sorts of soft science fiction stuff to follow. Um, and again, it's, it's also hugely influential for um, just being on, on its own hand. Um, Jack London's, because he's writing the first uh, story that's kind of this dystopian story, he can write the story he wants to write. He doesn't have to worry about, you know, sort of what, what's happened before, what he has to write against. Um, for example, if I were to write a, a, a dystopian novel and try to sell it, I would need to remember 1984 in my mind because 1984 is, you know, obviously the gold standard by which every dystopian story is judged. It was the best um, and the best selling, the most, the most um, verbose. Everybody knows 1984 and Big Brother and the language and mind think and such. So since we all know those things, I have to, if I was going to write about it, I would have to remember, keep that in my mind the entire time and either write um, with against 1984 to give you a counter um, example of it in a different dystopian or to write for it. Um, so I'd have to be, be doing it though with that in my mind. But one of the good things about reading the first of a lot of these things is that the first dystopian modern novel by Jack Lutton, he can just let the story be the story. He can let the story breathe. And that gives it a great opportunity to kind of just be whatever Jack Lutton wants it to be, um, which in this case is incredibly good. Jack London also um, is really good at sort of getting you in and getting you out and moving you on. So you don't have to worry about spending a bunch of time reading about things that have nothing to do with the story, like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, for example, which probably has half as, which probably twice as long than it needs to be because she's talking about philosophical things to half, half the time. Um, so she don't have to worry about that with, with a London story either, which is good. Again, hugely influential on a lot of different things. As a soft science fiction story, the, the point is to get you in and then get you into the characters. Um, a, a good ex example of a soft science fiction story is probably Dune um, by, by Hubbard. Um, you know, Hubbard just wants to get, only has the science fiction there to get you to the human stuff that he cares about, the human relationships, the human characters, and stuff. He doesn't even describe, you know, some of the, the technological stuff that he has, like the ornithopter isn't described at all. You don't even get a physical description of it in the novel. Who knows what it looks like? Um, he doesn't care. And well, he just uses that technology to get you to the place where he wants to talk about humans and civilizations and that sort of civilization clash and culture clash that he wants to talk about. It's the same thing's true of London. London wants to get you to what he wants to talk about, which is people and, and his socialist views. And so <coughs> those things are really what he cares about. And those are sort of his focus and his core, his raison d'etre. So 
the, the, the soft science fiction elements there. Um, he also accurately predicted a lot of these things, both in other nations and in, 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 in a large scale, and in America on a small scale. Um, so he's very, very, very good at predicting the future when it comes to this stuff. And which puts him, again, in sort of that same camp as an H.G. Wells, a Jules Verne, or if you watch my first video, a G.K. Chesney, who in the Battle of Dorking in 1871 accurately predicted a lot of the stuff that was going to happen in World War I and the first military science fiction story. That was also a soft science fiction story that just wanted to get you into the battles that were happening in the invasion in England. Um, he just wanted, so he just said it a few years in the future with enough technology to enable sort of this German enemy to get their, 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 their people past this sort of fleet that was sort of blocking London and to land so they can actually engage in the story that he wanted to and talk about. Um, so um, and just like a Chesney's invasion story of the Battle of Dorking or Wells or, or Verne, um, there is this sort of, uh, this is soft science fiction, I want to get you to it and so forth. H.G. Wells is also a master of this too. He wanted to write a story about people on the moon. So rather than spend a whole lot of time talking about what the technology looks like. He just invents um, an element that gets his people, that's lighter than air, that gets them to the moon. Let's move on. Um, so, <laughs> you know, that again, it's, it's, it's a popular way of getting people to, to the focus of the story, uh, which is to uh, the, the people, the characters, and the culture. So, London does that too with the Iron Heel perfectly. So that's the Iron Heel for you. If you've read the Iron Heel, I'd love to talk with you more about it in the comments below. Um, is, did you, were, was it something that you read um, previously? What did you think of the framing device? Did you think it like me is grounded, or do you disagree? Did you think it was you know something? Was there issues that you felt you had with it? Was it too socialist? Was it not socialist enough? What did you think? Um, if you've heard of Jack London but you've never heard of the Iron Heel like me, um, go check it out. It's going to be worth your time. It's great. It's great to read these. A lot of these are things. Things. And let me know what you thought about it in the in the links below. I'll have a link below. Uh, for the Amazon book so you can purchase it if you're interested in picking it up. Um, uh, please, if you like this video, please feel free to subscribe. There's going to be a lot more videos coming down the road, probably. At least I've already planned and I've already recorded a lot of them. Um, I'm going to be posting them here in a little bit. So if you like this and if it's something that you enjoyed, please, please subscribe to it. And again, thank you so much for your time. If you have watched this, then you have taken some time out of a busy day to watch my video. I really do appreciate it. So thank you.